The Labour Party and the Fenferi back organised Labour's planned indefinite strike for October the 3rd blames the Tinubu government's handling of the people's welfare. And a Boeing election petition tribunal upholds Governor Francis Mufuru's victory, strikes out the petitions of the People's Democratic Party and all progressive Grand Alliance ABGA for being pre-election matters lacking in merit. Well, happy Eid Maulud celebrations to Muslims across the country and the world. Welcome to Politics Today, live on Channels Television. I'm Kaido Kikilu here, Channels Television's global headquarters in Lagos. Well, tonight, the Labour Party and Pan Yoruba Social Cultural Organization of Feniferi have thrown their weight behind organized Labour's planned strike, which is scheduled for next Tuesday, that's October the 3rd. Let's show you the countdown. It is now exactly six days to go. And that's barring any changes the Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, and the Trade Union Congress, TUC, say they will shut down the nation and embark on protests if the Tinubu government fails to address the suffering and other socio-economic hardships occasioned by the removal of petrol subsidy. But a day after the announcement, which was yesterday, the Labour Party, in a statement, says... It fully supports Labour's move after following with keen interest various meetings between organized Labour and government bodies, including the President of the Senate, the Presidency, and the Ministers of Labour. Now, take a look at part of the statement which was signed by the Publicity Secretary of Labour Party, Mr. Obiara Elo. It reads in part that Labour Party is surprised that the government claimed that it has removed subsidies on petroleum products and that it now generates over a trillion naira monthly, yet it finds it difficult to address workers' demands. But that's not all. Similarly, the leader of Fanny Ferry Chief Ayode Banjo says the group opposes the neoliberal economic policies which it says is currently being pushed by the government and calls for welfare economics instead. While back in Labour's proposed strike, the group asks government and those in power to come down from their ostentatious lifestyle, saying that since the removal of petrol subsidy and other economic policies, which it says were hastily announced without planning for the collateral effect, the Nigerian masses have been abysmally pauperized, it says. So all eyes on the government now to make its move, and we hope that it's enough to pacify labor. But then there are questions. Questions about President Bola Tinubu's whereabouts. After the conclusion of his engagement at the 70th United Nations General Assembly, that's Onga, there's been no response from the presidency to our inquiries about the president's location. Neither has there been any official statement from his spokesperson regarding that. There have, however, been reports that the president left New York in the United States for France. The purpose of that trip, if indeed it happened, is also not officially stated. It is such a crucial time, really, for Nigeria as a nation, and Nigerians naturally will look to the president for his stare. But while we wait, let's tell you that the Independent National Electoral Commission at INEC has released the timetable and schedule of activities for the Edo and Ondo state governorship elections. Yes, there's still elections coming up in November in Bayelsa, Imo, and Kogi, but INEC released a statement just uh, yesterday uh, by the National Commissioner and Chairman Information and Voter Education Committee, Sam Olumeku, that the governorship election in Edo State will hold on Saturday, September the 21st, while party primaries will hold from February the 1st to the 24th, 2024. Let's go over to Ondo State, uh, where the governorship election will hold on Saturday, November the 16th, 2024, our primaries, party primaries, are scheduled to hold from April the 6th to the 27th of 2024. Yeah, it is a busy electioneering season, naturally. But that's not all that is trending on the political scene. Here's your political roundup. The Taraba State government says it's inherited an empty treasury from the previous administration. 
The state's head of security, Susie Nathan, disclosed this when she represented Governor Agbu Kefes at the flag of ceremony of a five-day professional development workshop for secretaries in ministries, departments and agencies in Taraba State. She adds that the present administration has resolved to restore the integrity of the civil service. Despite the empty coffers we met on the ground since taking over the office on May 29, 2023, I have made sure that employee salaries are paid on time. Ahead of the November 11 governorship election in Imo State, a political group known as the Okigwe Political Consultative Assembly in Imo State is urging Governor Hobo Zodema, who is seeking a re-election for a second term in office, to redouble his efforts and actions that will benefit the state's residents, in addition to the already implemented policies. While speaking on some of the desired policies and changes during a meeting in Obo, local government area of Imo State, the group appreciates the government programs that have had positive impact on the people of Imo North Senatorial District, popularly called Okiwe Zone. Ndio Okiwe have lost a share of all the money for the reconstruction of the 53 kilometer of the map of Imo Okiwe. There is no case say that this road remains an incurable monument to motorists and commuters for decades. An All Progressive Congress support group under the auspices of APC Young Progressive Forum is calling on President Bola Tinubu to appoint two additional ministers from the Southeast region, noting that the region has the lowest number of ministerial representation in his cabinet. Speaking at a news conference in Oka, the Anambra State Capital, the leader of the group, Mr. Pascal Candle, explains that their demand is to ensure fairness and justice in the representation of all geopolitical zones in the present administration. With the nomination of substantive Minister of Youth Development for Bora State, no central geographical zones with two states will now boast of nine ministers. While Southwest with six states will now have will now have ten ministers. Well, tonight we bring you more judgment from the election petition tribunal. Ebonyi State, Southeast Nigeria took the center stage today. But then the tribunal sat in the nation's capital, Abuja, after the president of the Court of Appeal, Monica Dongba Messon, in April, directed that the state election tribunal be relocated to Abuja. But here's what played out today. First, the court dismissed the petition filed by the candidate of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, Abga Bernadotto, against the victory of Governor Francis Umfuru of the All Progressives Congress for lacking in merit. Well, the crux of the case, amongst other things, was whether or not he had resigned from the PDP before vying for office. But in a unanimous judgment, the three-member panel headed by Justice Le Kongumoy dismissed the petition for lacking in merit. Afterwards, the court also dismissed PDP's petition, which centered on the same issues, amongst other things. Uh, it was dismissed for lacking in merit, as it were pre-election matters. Uh, the three-member panel held that it failed to prove that the governor was still a member of the PDP when he ran for governor. So let's uh, bring you reactions to the judgment. The court held that the petitioners failed to prove that the governor of a Bonny state is not a member of the APC but is instead a member of the PDP, which was what the petitioners had contended. The court also held that it was not proved that there was non-compliance with the Electoral Act in the election of the governor of Ebony State, His Excellency Francis Obonyanwifuru. The court also held that it was not proved that the governor of Abonyi State, His Excellency Francis Obonyi Yangwe-Ifru, did not score majority of lawful votes in the election. This is the first uh, step. We still have a uh, court of appeal and a uh, Supreme Court. So from the outset, we knew that if we win, they will go on appeal. And we know that if we if it goes this way, we will go on appeal. 
Well, we'll get into the Eboy issue in a moment, but tonight we begin with a burning matter which concerns Ondo State. And it's not about, perhaps it is about actually the elections which is coming, but that is still some months to come. There is an issue, the impeachment notice which was served uh, on the Deputy Governor, Honorable Loki Ayedatiwa, and of course his response. He's since gone to court in Akuredi on the state capital. And just yesterday there was a ruling from a court, a federal high court in the nation's capital, uh, Abuja, essentially stopping the impeachment proceedings. Uh, and the case is meant to be heard in October, the first few days of October. But the state assembly has responded to that court judgment. In fact, the state assembly says that there needs to be an investigation into that order that was given at the FCT High Court or the Federal High Court in the nation's capital, Abuja. Now, there you have on your screen the impeachment notice and uh, the details of the allegations uh, of gross misconduct against the Deputy Governor of Ondo State, Mr. Loki Ayedatiwa. Is this an impasse um between the Governor and the Deputy playing out in the State Assembly? What does this court ruling, the order from the Federal High Court in the nation's capital mean? Where do we go from here? What is going on with these allegations of gross misconduct? There's still a lot to clear out for Nigerians. And tonight on the program, we seek to do just that. So let's have this conversation. I have joining me on the program uh, this evening, Mr. Ige Ashimodara, who is a legal practitioner who's interested in this case, has been following uh, the case. He joins us live in our Lagos studios. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on yeah, Politics Day. And joining us uh, virtually, we have Mr. Uh, Emmanuel Emodamori, who is a counsel to the Undo State uh, Assembly on this matter as, as well. He joins us virtually uh, from Akure, the Undo State Capital. It's good to have you on the program as well. Well, let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Shimundara, in our studio. Uh, there's a lot going on in the courts in Abuja and Akure, the Undo State Capital. And of course, there's what is playing out in the State Assembly. But give us the benefit of your legal perspective. With that court order in the nation's capital stopping the impeachment proceedings, uh, what does this mean essentially? Does this mean the State Assembly, which is an independent arm of government as it is, can stop or should stop the proceedings, or as they say, they will go ahead with it? What exactly is the position of the law regarding this? Uh, thank you. Um, I will say straight away that uh, whenever there is a court order, whether rightly given or wrongly given, every party, every party to that suit must respect the court order. That is the law. You do not have the right to inquire into the rightness or wrongness of that order. The only body that has that power to do that is an appellate court. Even the court that gave that order has no right to look into it, except it is given uh, 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 based on fraud, it is an order that is null ab initio. That is only, the only time that the court itself can look at it. But apart from that, the only court that can look at it is at the appellate court. So, on this issue of impeachment, people will tell you that uh, section 188 uh, yeah. sub 10 outs the court's jurisdiction. No. What that provision says is that the proceedings of the panel the proceedings of the panel shall not be uh, uh, looked into by the court or any matter related to it. So this is an action that even precedes the setting up of the panel. As we speak, they have not even set up the panel. That action also preceded the, 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 the delivery of the notice mm. to the deputy governor. So to that extent, that order is the uh, 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 that whole sway as of today. And I can tell you, I can tell you again, it is not correct for the State Assembly to sit in Akure and decide that they will not uh, obey the court order, that the court does not have jurisdiction. In law, there's a principle called competence, competence. That principle is that a court reserves the right to determine its own jurisdiction. If you challenge if, for instance, they come to court and say Section 188 sub 10, how is the court's jurisdiction? 
you have to come before that court and challenge that jurisdiction. Let the court, they should go to the court in Abuja and challenge the uh, jurisdiction of the court to entertain that uh, suit. Because you cannot sit at the assembly and, 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 and say the court has no jurisdiction. You know, the assembly put out a statement, uh, by the way, these are some of the allegations, which we'll get into very important uh, allegations that we need to break down this evening. But, you know, in the response of the assembly, it says that, isn't this preemptive? I mean, the panel has not even listened to the deputy governor. He has not responded to those allegations. So, and, and it cited some Supreme Court cases that it has not even sat. So how is, are the allegations that there will not be fair hearing? Is there any proof placed on the table to speak to the case, the, the, the grounds of the case uh, which were put forward? You see, one of the very serious issues we have in this country is the abuse of our legal processes and abuse of our institutions. Uh, in your introductory remark, you said uh, maybe it's related to the next election, or and then you said uh, uh, the elections are not even here yet. The truth is that the elections are upon us. And I can tell you that this is not unconnected with the permutations for the next election coming up in November 2024. Uh, there are several issues. It is not in a state where the governor, as we speak, it's not of sound health that we're not start talking about impeaching the deputy governor. Who takes over? They are just trying to pave way for some sort of uh, anarchy so that they, 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 they benefit from this. I would know those persons who are behind it. This is a state where, as we speak, this same element, the House of Assembly, has refused to account for the oil derivation fund that they got from the federal government. Go to Elijah and I said, what they are doing, if you, knew, if you, if you had gone through uh, Lucky Aida to ask for you see that it's from Ondo South, uh, Elijah local government. Now, part of their fear is that any Elijah said the man that is too cold, uh, close to government is not good for them. So they want to shut everybody out because those two local governments are the oil producing areas of Ondo State. Do, do you and have so, proof for these allegations which you speak to? Uh, which allegation? That they want to shut some people out. That has been their trend. At the appropriate time, we release it to the public. Okay, you, the question I ask particularly is just uh, the propriety of this order or this ruling because the case of Abari Bay versus Abia State House of Assembly uh, has been cited where the Court of Appeal uh, stated that it is wrong for the appellants to jump the gun by rushing to the courts to stop his impeachment process on the ground of alleged breach of fair hearing when the panel to investigate and hear him had not even been constituted. Now, you, you have just read uh, a portion of that case. The issue is not, the issue uh, upon which um, that action was taken was not fair hearing. It was abuse of the processes of the House of Assembly. So there are two different things. And beyond that... So, pardon me. So let's speak to that. If you say abuse of the processes. So what processes were abused? Now... Or tell us what the processes are. I mean, is it uh, the, the, the one-third or whatever, two-thirds provisions, how they're meant to serve him the notice? Tell us those provisions and which of them were breached. Now, the processes that I meant is that... You see, you don't begin to... Uh, you don't begin an impeachment process by going to the media, by going to the social media. What they wanted to do is to first of all call uh, a dog a bad name in order to hang it. So the first thing was to, uh, uh, to, to demarket him in the media space and then look for a way of slotting. You remember that I watched uh, Mr. Boadi Borua, senior advocate of Nigeria on this, uh, on this program, I think about last week. And part of the, allegation, the allegations that were circulating in the media, which he also reeled out on this program, was that they were saying that he collected 300 million naira for the purchase, purchase of armored vehicle. As of today, the, the impeachment process which he was served does not contain that allegation again. They are now doing what we call fishing, looking for all sort of allegations that they can reel wherever they can reel it, and then, level, uh, and, and then heap it on him. So the, 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 the truth is that they are just misusing that power that has been given to them by, uh, by, 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 by law. I, my question is about the process, and I'd like you to uh, identify the part. I mean, you speak to media. The statement which was put out by the Assembly says that, in fact, they did not release the 
allegations on, on which they're trying to impeach him up until he was served because they wanted to respect him. So if you say that they were released to the media or there was a media trial, uh, on what basis, what proof do you have? And I'd like you to speak particularly to those areas you think were really breached in the process of impeachment. Now, um, <clears throat> you see the provision of section one, uh, it, it is clear on the procedure, the setting up of, um, sorry, the one third uh, signature uh, collection. Which they say they which, met. Which, which they have done, yes, they got 11 out of 26, so that is sufficient for two thirds, uh, for one third. Then the next stage is uh, getting the uh, CJ to set up uh, the seven man panel. And then after that, there's another, uh, after the 14 days, there's another seven days procedure for uh, the investigation, all of that. Now, we have not even gotten to that stage. The stage that they are now is that they have just served the deputy governor. Now, look at those allegations. I don't want to go into the merits of the allegation. Right. But you will see that those allegations that were flying in the media space before now had changed. Because indeed, it, the, those allegations have no basis, whether in law or in fact. And all of these are targeted at the policies of 2024. But nobody is saying, nobody is assuring APC that APC will get on door again. Nobody is assuring them. But they should not set on door on fire because of their political intrigue. This is a state where the governor has been away for more than three months. He came back. We have not seen him active. And nobody is talking about that. What he's talking about, the whole of Wondo South, South has been has been blackout for the past 15 years. No electricity enjoyed by any of the any of the six local governments in Wondo in Wondo South, and the assembly is not looking at that. The 60 percent um, derivation that should go to um, the oil producing area from the 30 percent oil derivation, nobody is accounting for it. As I speak to you, there is no. There's no single project of also by the Industrial Producing Area Development Commission, which is like a, 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 a replication of the NDDC at yeah. the state level. Has no single project in the whole of like So this is um, this, the issues you raise are issues of governance. Yes. So is this an indictment then on the governor himself? On the, on the government of Ondo State generally, not just the governor. On the oh. government of Ondo State, including the governor. Of which the deputy governor is also a part of that government. Yes, he is. But you see, that's, that, that is a problem. You know, you, you, you know when, I'm not absorbing the deputy governor from the misgovernors, but you know that in Nigeria, the deputy governor or the vice president is more or less, um, how do I describe, I don't want to use the word that is derogatory, but it's more or less a, an office where you just sit down and look and take instruction. If uh, like uh, one fellow said that uh, you don't want to say something, your guy at the top say, says another thing. So the deputy governor he does not have, uh, how do I put it, does not have that power to go out without the governor's permission. But he has the freedom of expression. If anything is not going right, at least if not to his principal, he owes it to the people of the state to speak up. Yes, he does. So why hasn't he spoken he, 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 up if he, what, indeed what I don't want to, I'm not here to defend the deputy governor. But what I would tell you, what I would tell you is that this is a deputy governor that the governor was away for 30 months. He came back about two weeks ago. We have not even seen him after that. He relocated our, uh, our government house to Ibadan. We've not heard from him. And the man, at least as far as we know, uh, acted loyally to him. And then only for us to start seeing impeachment notice. So if he acted this, uh, this uh, uh, loyally and faithfully and they, and they are putting forward impeachment for him, how much more when they start challenging his principal? So these are the issues. Well, they are uh, political issues, but should bother all of us. And ultimately, these are governance issues yes. because the people of Ondo State deserve good governance. That's why they go out to vote in any case. Well, we expect uh, Mr. Emmanuel uh, Modamori, who is counsel to the Ondo State Assembly, uh, to join us on the program. I understand we've now established connection uh, with him. Thank you for joining us on the program, Mr. Modamori. I'm sure you followed the conversation, and I'd just like you to uh, respond to some of the issues uh, that Mr. Ashimudara raised here uh, on the program. If you can hear me, Mr. Modamari, please go ahead.
right. Uh, we'll try to reconnect or at least reestablish connection with uh, Mr. Modamori because quite uh, major issues Hello, raised there. Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Uh, your opening comments. Well, he has said that the court's ruling first is binding on the assembly and he had raised some issues with the procedure which the state assembly is going through in at least pursuing this impeachment process. Your thoughts? Unfortunately, I couldn't connect you in time and I really regret that. But it appears you're asking me for the procedure. The procedures are outlined in section 188, subsection 1 to 11 of the constitution. First, you need one third, uh, one third um, members of the house to initiate what we call the impeachment notice. And then, um, in this case, you had 11 members of the house signing the impeachment notice. More than Oh dear, not to worry, uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. But uh, you wanted to come in, uh, Mr. Shimudara, uh, on that point. I don't know if you wanted to respond to the yes, point you made, uh, but it looks like we've not been quite clear on your point about procedure, the procedure. And I also want you to speak to the separations of power here. The State Assembly has its own, uh, its, its own responsibility, which is clearly spelt out in the law, not just appropriation, it has oversight, oversight and of course all of these other functions. So it is clear. Is this not one arm of government trying to uh, arm twist the other from going ahead with the procedures, which you said is actually following to the letter? Mm, I, I do not exactly think uh, that uh, an arm of government is trying to arm twist the other. The concern is clear. Despite the provision of section 188 sub 10, which I have mentioned, that some people rely on to say that the court decision is ousted. If you go further down in the country, I think section 287 subtly or thereabout, the, the constitution mandates even the House of Assembly to be all court orders without exception. Now, there's a way you interpret legislations. A later provision of a legislation supersedes the earlier one. But isn't it curious that an impeachment notice was served and as usual, you would expect that the deputy governor would go and defend himself, lay the issues bare, at least in line with the constitution, because if an impeachment notice is served, the onus is on you to respond. So why go to the court first before going to the state assembly? Well, I, I believe that the impeachment notice was served on him about two or three days ago. This court's case had come before the impeachment notice was served. So, uh, and I believe the time within which you need to respond has not expired. So let us wait to, uh, let's give him that benefit of uh, uh, doubt. Right. Let, him, let, let us wait for the expiration of that time and see what he does. Okay, we, we're due for a break now. When we return, we'll definitely get uh, Mr. Motamori uh, to speak for the State Assembly because it's quite important to get exactly what is going on in Ondo State for the good of the people and for the good of Nigeria's democracy. So stay with us, we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to the program. The impeachment notice has been served on the Undo State Deputy Governor Loki Ayedatu Aboda. Federal High Court in Abuja gave an order saying that, well, the Assembly should stop the process. If you take a look at that impeachment notice, particularly uh, the allegations of gross mis misconduct, there is a total of 14 allegations in that document, really. And I'll just go through some of the uh, allegations that... Uh, he misappropriated or flagrantly approved the sum of 100 million naira as capital vote of a state emergency management fund. Allegation 13 says that he misappropriated 150 million naira meant for the state emergency management agency. Allegation 12 says that he misappropriated 100 million naira, which was approved by the governor meant for the state emergency management agency yet again. Uh, allegation 11 speaks to uh, the fact that Honorable Loki Aedatiwa uh, concerted with a certain Mr. Aki Showare, who was then commissioner for local government and chief city affairs and collected uh, a sum of, what, 250 million naira only for the own use, thereby enriching himself contrary to the public office's law of Ondo State, and it goes on 
and on. So these are some of the allegations. We we'll still have with us uh, Mr. Ige Ashimudara, who is uh, a legal practitioner, uh, interested party in this case. Uh, I mean, looking at those allegations, they are quite weighty, and and the monies are a huge sums. So, I mean, if allegations were served on you as a person, wouldn't you naturally defend them? It is natural that I would defend them. I also expect the deputy governor to defend those allegations. Uh, uh, my point is not that you shouldn't defend it, which is which I have uh, emphasized the other time. Now, for instance, the last allegation you read out that he connived with one uh, Akinshore, who, who was the commissioner for chief and local government affairs, that person is still the sitting commissioner for uh, commerce in Ondo State. So, if it is genuine and true that um, the deputy governor connived with uh, a city commissioner, the governor will have fired him. The assembly has an over, they, it has, it has the power to summon him. So why isolating I hear that? Well, because they consider a person like, someone like Akinshore as a lesser threat for the purpose of the election. So you think this is all geared towards the election? I so believe. Well, let's speak with uh, Mr. Modamori. We have him back with us. And I'd like you to respond particularly. I've read some of the allegations put out there. And he says that, well, if other names were mentioned, why not go after those other names as well? Go ahead. Can you hear me, Mr. Kayode? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, I suppose you directed the question to me. I've been able to catch up with you. Um, I can barely um, understand the preamble. Oh, well, it looks like it's a function of the connection, really. But uh, we'll try to have this. Perhaps you might want to change your bandwidth, uh, which appears a little bit challenging. So we can get answers to some of the questions uh, raised and get more insight uh, into this matter. But... I'll come back to you, Mr. Shimodara, because you were making that point before uh, I went back to Mr. Emodamori. So, uh, these allegations are there in the public. But you said that um, he had gone to court before the impeachment notice yes. was served. But, I mean, this impeachment notice, to talk about it, had been on since last week. So, uh, when, it, when was this case instituted? I understand instituted? that. I, don't, I understand it was served. Today is 27th, isn't it? I understand that it was served on 25th. That court case uh, uh, had preceded the service of uh, that notice. Because I spoke with the spokesperson of the state assembly okay. last week. And as at last week, it was not served. As at last week, but they had actually prepared that. They had moved the motion it, it, last week, so it was already out there. Yes, it was aware. Yes. But you see, and that's why I needed to go read Section 10 very well. What the step he has taken, I mean, the deputy governor has taken, preceded the, the, the setting the motion of the whole process. Once that process starts, it's on autopilot. Nobody stops it. But if you are taking an action before it starts, then your action can. So we, we, we should allow the courts to interpret this. The whole essence of, uh, of the court is to, interpret, is to interpret these provisions and do justice. So let us not be afraid. If you, if, if, you're, if you so much believe in your case uh, as a litigant, then go to court. Let the court ventilate these issues. So if the assembly were to go ahead, as it said, uh, with this impeachment process, what would happen? What the would assembly happen? would be violating section 287 sub 3 of the constitution. But the assembly that itself says it wants to even investigate that order that was given in Abuja. The assembly... The assembly will be acting on acting ultraviolet for a state assembly to say it wants to <laughs> it wants to investigate the federal high court. Is it wrong to seek to get to the root of the matter, perhaps report the judge and find out uh, what exactly went out, or went on rather? No, 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 no. It's a it's a different thing if you if you, if the assembly is saying that the uh, the body set up for the purpose of. Um, supervising and disciplining the judges uh, is going to be contacted for investigative purposes and all of that. 
than for the assembly to say we are going to investigate. Who give, who give, who give the assembly such power? Okay, uh, they just are proposing to themselves a power that the, the law has not given. To okay, them. let's expand this conversation because it doesn't just concern uh, the legislature; it also concerns the executive because yes. the governor of Ondo State was actually is actually a party to the case that was filed. At least in Akure, we are aware of that. Let's speak with Mr. Uh, Donyo Debawale, who's the SSA to Governor Rotimi Akerodo, who joins us virtually on the program uh, tonight. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Dr. Debawale. So, I mean, he has raised some very vital issues. One, I recall the last time we had the conversation, uh, there was a certain talk about uh, 300 uh, million Naira SUV, which uh, the Deputy Governor uh, had sought to purchase. But that particular allegation is not in this impeachment uh, notice, and he raised that point. So, please, you've watched how this is going. I imagine that Governor Rotimi Akiridulu is also aware. Uh, what is his position on this whole process? Well, thank you very much for having me. I, I need to make some quick clarifications. The House of Assembly is a separate arm of government. And the notion that the that uh, the governor is the one controlling the house or the one initiating the process is unfounded that is one then the second one concerning the three the so-called 300 million era uh, armored vehicle you know but nobody ever said that he purchased but he he instructed instructed the ssg I have the copy of the letter and the, the, the memo. He instructed the SSG to purchase the SUV armored vehicle for his office. And the value of that is 300 million. Then maybe I should, I should quickly also add this that he had requested that the governor to purchase this for his office before the governor departed. And the governor in his video, I said, look, you should wait because he requested for four vehicles, four vehicles. He requested for a Helos van, he requested for an SUV, and requested for articulated um, vehicle, and one, and the boss, IAS boss, the governor approved three before he traveled, and the deputy governor received two out of the three approved by the governor. So when the deputy governor got the wind that the governor will be returning during the last week of August, he calls the acting um, permanent secretary in his office, one Mr. Ojo, to write to him requesting that the armored vehicle in his the armored uh, the bullet resistant vehicle in his office is no longer functional, and that they should get a new one, and he approved it. He sent it to the SSD. That was what we said. And I said, it's a gross abuse of office. It is even it is an act of disloyalty because he knew that the governor would come back and the governor had said, look, wait, there is no money. So where was he expecting the money to come from? He did this, he, he approved it for himself on the 23rd of August, 2023. After the state had received the palliative funds, there was no funds elsewhere. And you don't spend 300 million naira. You don't buy either either armored vehicle or ordinary or anything without appropriation. The yeah. governor. Uh, pardon me to come in here, Dr. Debowale. Uh, there's still a number of issues I'd like you to respond to. But uh, does that mean that Governor Akiridalu considers his deputy as a man of questionable character? Well, I will not say so. I, I mean, because 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 you see, I, I, I wouldn't want the governor to be misquoted. What I'm saying that you see, he who wants equity must do equity. And equity follows the law. And you know, you may you may say anything about the government. Maybe they are playing politics. They are doing, why and why not? And why not? They are politicians primarily. If it is about them um, 2024, that is their problem. But when the when the evidence is ocular, and Fonny said this, there is little you can do to add on break. Once you have things reduced into writing, for instance, somebody asking that the office of the um, Commission for Finance should give him millions of naira to buy tires, he, he received this money, and within a short while, he wanted to buy the same tires again. You are fat, and people are saying that we should not look into that. 
So this has nothing to do with the governor. The House of Assembly has the duty to perform its over, you know, oversight function. I have to write in this house, which appropriates funds that they spend. So, so he, he made a point uh, earlier on that, uh, Mr. Shemudara, that the allegation of the 300 million naira used to, said to have uh, been requested to purchase uh, Ahmad SUV. Uh, why was it not included in the impeachment uh, notice, particularly the gross misconduct, which was stated 14 of them? Why wasn't that one particularly included? Only the members of the house can tell you that because I, I was not privy to what went on in that house. I was not privy. But I got the memo sent to the office of the SSG, among several other things. You had just 14 allegations. There were several other things, 30 ones. 30, 30 ones. So you see, the, um, this idea of uh, accusing a man who has been regarded as, brought, as being incapacitated, as becoming a vegetable, they even sponsored his obituaries more than six times. I think it is wicked. It is wicked. Defend yourself. When, when did the governor then, when did he get wind uh, of these issues? When did he uh, start thinking, okay, maybe my deputy needs to be looked into? Because it looked like they've had uh, a cozy relationship uh, ever since uh, the beginning, at least the start of the second time out. So when did he begin to notice uh, these issues? The issues concerning these allegations? Concerning his deputy, the issues that are now being impeached at the State Assembly. Well, you see, the, the, the governor has no bone to pick in this one, in this current fight. It is the House of Assembly. And the House of Assembly, you can see the allegations. You can see specific references made to acts of malfeasance, recklessness. So it is incumbent on who is being accused now to discharge that onus. We are saying, okay, you have acted irresponsibly. By we, I mean the house, the representatives of the people. I say you have acted irresponsibly. When you don't have electricity in a larger, you don't have a Lokitipa or in Bobini where my wife comes from, it is for this same reason that people will not do what is, what is correct. That you don't act responsibly. Come and tell us why only you will collect 10 million for two days of, I mean, we collect millions of naira for a trip. You will not make, you want to go to your village, you collect millions of naira. You know, what is unreasonable? So, when they say this, and you now rush to court, you did not only go to high court, uh, Abuja, federal high court, because you, you, you lack faith, you don't believe in state high court, Ondo state high court, where you are deputy governor. You don't believe in the judicial system of Ondo state. You went forum shopping. You went to Abuja, to restrain the House of Assembly in Ondo, and you don't see that as wrong. You now cleverly, or otherwise, joined the Inspector General of Police and the DSS. You have the Commissioner of Police in, in uh, Ondo State. You have the Director. Well, you're also a legal practitioner, and I, and I wonder if, if, I mean, if you don't think that's an indictment on the court, particularly Justice American Witt of the Federal High Court who restrained uh, the State Assembly. But in line uh, with that, there are two issues I want to, to quickly respond to. One, uh, allegation number 11 mentioned a certain Mr. Akin Showare, who uh, Mr. Shemudara here now confirms that is uh, the Commissioner for Commerce Industry in the state. And if these allegations are weighty enough and the governor is aware, why hasn't he taken action on his commissioner who is mentioned here? Why just the deputy governor? May, may I tell you straight away that you see, before the governor took in, I think the penultimate ESCO meeting held, the issue came up. There were petitions written against the deputy governor and Mr. Akinshore of gross misconduct. Those who wanted to become first class traditional rulers, they were levied. They were collecting palm oil, collecting yam, they were collecting this in fact, they became Orisha. They were collecting all manner of things. That is a fact. Go and get the minutes of the of the of the health committee. And because of the intervention of people, they moved him from Ministry of Local Government and Chief Tennessee Matters to Commerce. And the deputy governor was stripped of the sole responsibility to take charge of uh, local government, as it used to be. Agbola was not, was not controlled. 
He had all the powers. He was given all the latitude. That's why the, the, the misconception that um, the deputy governor had been his theater, that is not correct. He controlled ministries. But you see, when you send them on an errand and they start collecting palm oil, collecting yam, collecting money for people, LCDA, LCDA, they were going to create LCDA, they were collecting money. Uh, Dr. Rebowali, uh, so tell us as a legal practitioner as, as well, the court has given an order. Do you expect the State Assembly to proceed with the impeachment process against the order of the court? Well, you see, uh, they have their lawyer. I cannot speak for their lawyer. I don't speak for them. But, you know, I am an associate of Oluji Man you know, in Ibadan. And I've, I've put in some 20 something years as a legal practitioner. So, and I do know, I do know that when another subsists, there are steps to take. But it's for, for, for a judge who also granted an order, ex parte, something as serious as this, restraining an arm of government from performing its, its, its constitutional role, its statutory duty. There's also a remedy for whoever feels aggrieved against, even against the judge. And the lawyer who did that, we have precedents. Then again, we as lawyers are guided. Particularly about, uh, particularly about what will be the next line of action for the State Assembly. With this order, this ruling, are they meant to proceed with the impeachment process or try to resolve the case at the court? No, only their lawyer, who, I mean, the lawyers who have been briefed. And, and talk on that. practitioner and as you said you've not just practiced you have lectured as well and i know a lot of your students are watching you so what should be the next line of action i'm not going to teach uh, mr lucky that you are an esteem about how we do it and how we did it in in Okoju and Adeleke. I, I was privileged to have participated in that i was a very junior counsel i, I followed akiti you know, fight with me, all of these people, the Korean Anthony General. So, you know, we are not going to teach them. Let them, I mean, let us continue to play this game. We won't teach them. We won't teach them. If, if they are humble enough, they will, they, will, they will do what is right. But I do know that no court, no court can shut out the arm of government. No court. But the power that the court has is that of review. You cannot restrain an act that has commenced. You cannot. But let's let's wind down now, uh, Dr. Debowale, because I, I wanted you to really speak to this. Uh, to, should they go ahead or not go ahead? But a lot of people have also raised this question. Uh, the governor had issues with his former deputy, which you referenced. Now, there's almost a similar scenario playing out, this time at the State Assembly. And then people will naturally ask, so is it really about those deputies or the governor himself now, because twice he's had issues with his deputies. Well, for as long as you have those who are inordinately ambitious, for as long as you have those who think too much of themselves, then you continue to have this. What was the issue with the first one? He wanted to contest against his principal. He wanted to contest. That was the issue. Then he moved to PDP. He lost in PDP. He moved to Zenit Labour Party. He lost again. Then he came back. He contested whether to be a senator. He lost. Maybe he, at first he said he was the one who was um, bringing members to Aketi. He was the politician. Aketi was just working law. He, uh, he lost. He lost. He has been losing. Then this one was almost a non entity as far as politics of Ondo State was concerned before he was nominated. I knew him in 2012. When he came to meet Aketi, 2012 or 2013 or thereabouts, when he came to meet Aketi, you know what? He has never had any office before he became the deputy governor. I, and I also know that when he was nominated as the representatives of uh, the, the people of the South, my wife's people, many people protested. And Aketi was insistent that let him be the one who killed Jesus, that Jesus had forgiven him. Aketi said he will be. They, they did not allow him to occupy the office for one day. Aketi said no. And stuff like that. Now he, 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 he could not represent. So when the turnout came, when that one went to commit political suicide, 
then it was his luck and he was even trying to say oh he was lucky you know i hate it that one and stuff like that the only he can explain at the point at the point at which Aketi became an enemy because until before Aketi took in or until he was accused of misappropriating funds of local government there was no problem between him and Aketi. Aketi came in the latitude to so uh, it appears as though uh dr debo ali well what we know about the constitution is it gives people everyone equal opportunities equal rights to aspire even to political offices, really. Everybody started from somewhere. But let's wind down, uh, really, because it appears as though you're saying, well, the government, the governor himself, uh, will just watch and see how this uh, goes on. But, uh, Mr. Shimodara, as we wind down on this, next line of action, because it looks like that's a major bone of contention, he says that they know how the game is played. What do you expect from the State Assembly well, and from the Deputy Governor? Well, I expect the State of Assembly to obey the order that uh, the Lord Home Justice uh, Mecca uh, Witty has given. Uh, I expect that um, if they do not believe that the court has jurisdiction, they should go to that court and challenge it. It is the law that if you dispute a court's jurisdiction, you go before that court and challenge it. You don't do it outside the court. You bring it uh, before the court to do it. And the court will look at it. If the court says it has jurisdiction, you go on the you go to the applicant. Then on the part of deputy governor, I expect that if allegations have been made against him, he should respond to them. Um, but beyond that, Mr. Deborah or Dr. Deborah, when he was speaking, he said uh, uh, there will be problem of impeachment like this as much as people who think too much of themselves. That means the impeachment itself is not about you and I. It's not about the law. It's about ego. So the deputy governor does not have the right to aspire if he aspires. This one is not aspiring. The other one, Agbola, they say was aspiring. This one is not aspiring. There's a problem because it's not aspiring. So we, we don't run, we don't run a government as if, uh, you are, as if uh, we are driving slaves. Government is not slave driving. So people should be able, because the ticket of the government said it's not valid without the deputy government. That's what the conscience says. I didn't say it. It's not valid. But the law also appreciates that he is the boss for the purpose of that office. But doesn't mean that at all times, because when Dr. De Barale came, he said that he was speaking for, at some point he said he was speaking for the governor. When critical questions were thrown at him, he would push it away. At some other point, he would speak for the At other time, he would, he would dodge the question. So we should be able to be transparent with these issues. It's what should bother us is the interest of doing those people. He mentioned on those south now that they have not been, they have not been lying there for almost 15 years. And he said uh, uh, the deputy governor is thinking of buying bulletproof car. Is it this deputy governor issue that came up within the last three months that made them not to provide electricity in on those south for the past 15 years? And we have been crying. No good roads there. And this is. This is the hot pot that cooks the food for those states. In terms of oil? In terms of oil, in terms of uh, aquatic... Uh, uh, you, know, that's, that, you see, that part of those state has the longest coastline in this country. Ah, we have to wind down now, Mr. Ashimudara. I'd like Dr. Debo Boali to have uh, a final word on this. In 30 seconds, is there a way back to the governor's heart uh, for Mr. Ayedatiwa? Well, only the governor can say that, but let me also say that, you see, the people of the South, my wife's people, have been their own enemies. Let him tell you the number of ND, NDDC representatives from that place who have served in court and who have not been able to do anything. Go to that place and see what, how they teach their own people. They are the enemies of their own people. They live in Akure, they buy hotels, they do all, all manner of stupid things. That is that. They said talking about dodging questions. No, I'm not dodging any questions. I'm not. I came and made positive assertions concerning malfeasance. And I said, I talked about recklessness. And now they came out with 14 allegations. I'm saying that we have more than that. We have to anchor at this point, really. But we'd like to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Donio Debowale, as I said to Governor uh, Rotimi Akeridolu. Thank you for your time, as well as Mr. Egyashi Mudara, who is a lawyer, a legal practitioner. We're meant to have Mr. Emmanuel Lemodamori, who's a counsel to the State Assembly, but uh, the connection failed. Well, that's where we anchor tonight on the program. We had hoped to speak with the Eboyi State Governor, Mr. Francis Wefur, but perhaps we'll reschedule that for another time, since his plane just landed moments ago. That's the package for tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaido Kikilu. Good night.